Hi, Hello. Alex. Thanks so much for being on the Love and Learn podcast. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Yes, I've been so excited to chat with you. And I feel like I say this now with so many of my guests, but I've been wanting to have a deeper conversation or collaborate in some sort of way. And I feel like it's taken a while for us to actually do that. But I'm really glad that you'll get to share your wisdom with the Love and You Learn community today. Yeah, great. Awesome. Well, for those who may not have come across you or for Love We Heal, can you just share a little bit more about how you kind of got into this work and your own journey with relationship OCD? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, so, so I, I struggled with relationship OCD or relationship anxiety, whatever we're calling it here for, um, I mean, since I really dated, which goes back to, I don't know, 18 um and it wasn't until my most recent relationship that i'm in now that it was really bad like before it was you know it was like oh, i'm not really sure about things i would kind of look up lay in bed and wonder if i was with the right partner but i was kind of able to brush it away but it wasn't until i got with dion that things really got pretty bad um and what seemed to exacerbate it was uh, we we did long distance for a little bit. I'm sure you've heard of lots of people who have ROCD and they're doing long distance and there seems to be a, a connection there. Um, and it was in the midst of a massive move, a huge career change. So there was a really big transition that I was going through and, and, um, and you know, it, it hit me and, and I, um, I was completely unsure of whether I love my partner or not. And, uh, and it was familiar to me because I had gone through it before and I knew what I was going through rationally from a rational standpoint. I knew this is just normal. I'm having doubts, but it, it took me into a place of real despair, you know, couldn't eat, couldn't sleep. I was trying to get through school, um, at the time of doing my counseling work and stuff. Um, I was, you know, I, there was a lot of shame and, and, and a lot of, I didn't feel like I could really tell anybody because of the taboo of the thoughts and um, not to mention Dion actually coming to that counseling school and doing the, you know, so everyone knew Dion and everyone knew me. So with the processing that we were doing in school and, and all of the, you know, experiential work, I was holding this thing and I didn't feel like I could say it. So, um, yeah. So anyway, I eventually found a therapist and I started working on myself and I, um, I started to get a handle on what I was going through and, um, sort of long story short, um, I, I, um, blanking. It's okay. Yeah. Just getting that part to to step back so this is very interesting you know what this is actually good because it gives us a chan chance to kind of tie in the ifs a little bit here so i have a blanking part and it's interesting the fact that it's stepping in now because i'm just about i'm entering into some vulnerability so it's like the blanking part's like, okay, I don't know if we want to go there. You know, Sarah's got so many people watching this and it's really scared of me being vulnerable. So what I kind of do when this happens is, um, and this is something that maybe your viewers can do when they're noticing their relationship anxiety coming up or whatever parts of them that are coming up. It's just really letting these parts know that like we're totally safe here. And that I know that I can do this. And I know we can do this. Okay. So bring me back to where we were. Yeah. Where was I? 
<laughs> well, first off, I just want to tip my hat off to that. And for those who, I mean, we're recording this on video, but you'll hear this in audio. And Alex was pausing and putting a hand on his heart and his chest and his eyes were closed and he was really feeling into what he was about to say. And I can tell just how much you've obviously practiced what you're preaching because you didn't just try to push through that you allowed it to show up. So I just want to reflect that yeah. back to you. And for anyone that wasn't getting to see that it was really powerful to me. And just a reminder that even if you are blinking in the middle of something like it's yeah. you and your body, you're allowed to slow down and revisit that. So thank you for modeling that for me. Absolutely. And I, th I think in the past, I would have just been like, holy shit, I'm blanking. Like, I'm going to look nervous and awkward and I like, just have to push through this. Where was my thought? But yeah, I've, yeah, it's, I think it is really important to pause and check in and see what's going on and know that we're just, this is a human experience and it's okay. Like, it's okay to, to feel this way and, and bringing it, it's a practice for me. It's an everyday thing to bring compassion to myself for how, what's showing up for me instead of like, you're such an idiot. Like you're going to look so stupid on a podcast and you know, it's, it's a, it's an opportunity for me to go, you know, actually this, this makes sense on some level. And, and when I reflect back on my history and what I've gone through and the things that have led to me blanking out and not being able to share my authenticity and my vulnerability, I really get you blanking part for stepping in and trying to protect me from, potentially making a fool of myself and being embarrassed and being shamed and all that stuff. So yeah. Okay. I feel better now. Good. And I think that's such a, well, we'll get back to your story here in just a second, but I just want to say to everyone, I think this is such an important thing that we're going to dive into in today's episode is these different parts of ourselves and your vulnerability inspired me even now, just to say that I still get nervous. Like when I'm coming on these episodes, even though this is my quote, quote podcast, I'm still having some of those nervous flutters too of, am I going to say that right thing? And so it's so important to be open so that others get permission to feel the same. Exactly. So this whole experience, I feel like is exactly why I love doing podcasts because it gets to show, like you said, a little bit more of that authenticity instead of this filtered version of us. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate yeah. that. Of course. So I believe you were just about to explore kind of like when you started working with a therapist, you started having some of these insights as to what was going on and you started realizing some things about why this was showing up for you so much in your relationship. Yeah. So, you know, I, I it was through getting a handle on it and making my way through it and really exploring where it was coming from in me that I, um, you know, I was able to kind of identify the roots to what I was dealing with. I knew, I knew on the surface that what I was experiencing rationally was something called relationship OCD. I knew I had anxiety. I knew I had anxiety since I was a kid. Um, I, I, I knew all that, but I didn't quite understand why I was feeling the way that I did. And through exploring that with in therapy in psychedelic work that I've done in um, with, with IFS, with reflection, with journaling, with just anything I could get my hands on, um, I really started to understand where it originated from. And, um, and then eventually getting through it and getting through it, I say, because, you know, it's funny. I, I thought I was done with relationship anxiety. I thought it was over. And we moved to Ontario from Nova Scotia and it another big transition. And it I got slapped in the face again. You know, I got activated and the doubts came up. And it was like, I was like, whoa, I thought, you know, I thought this was over. And it was a it was a point where I was like, this is a long journey here. Like and I know that it, I personally know it's possible to fully heal the roots to relationship anxiety and we can get to the other side and we might not experience the, the obsessiveness and all that again. But for me, it's a reflection of like, you know what, I just have more work to do and that's okay. And I'm just going to keep going. And um, I think it says a lot about my journey so far for me to be able to kind of just, I still get, like, I, I still have parts of me that are like, 
really? Like, are we here again? Like, this is ridiculous. This sucks. But I also behind that, I have the place in me that says, ah, here we are again. And that's okay. And we're gonna, we'll just work through this. There's just, this, there's just more work to do here. And um, so, so that where just started getting back to what I was saying through working with it, it really inspired me to help other people get through this because of how debilitating it is and how scary it is and how taboo it is and, and how, you know, how little people get this issue. So um, it's sort of propelled me into the work that I do. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. powerful. And I love that you were able to just acknowledge as well that there are times when this still can creep back in because I think that, so often when it comes to anxiety or OCD work or just any sort of quote, quote, mental health challenge, we just are trying to fix it and get rid of it. And I love that you alluded to this longer journey that we're on. And another thing you alluded to so well and was just able to model in this conversation is these different parts of you that are kind of opposing sometimes and one thought maybe agrees yeah. that it's okay for this to come back, but one part of you is, you know, <laughs> why is this happening? And so that kind of tees up the conversation of internal family systems and this parts work a bit more. So for those who might not be familiar with these different parts you're talking about or this internal family system, can you explain a little bit more about that work? And because I know that's your sure. expertise. Sure. Okay, so IFS is a parts-based model, and um, it goes off the idea that we we are not sort of one single mind. We have uh, multiple parts of our personality that make up who we are, who we think we are. And um, in IFS, there's there's protective parts, and there's what we call exiles. And the exiles are the ones that carry... Um, our trauma, our pain, our difficult histories, uh, and they're the ones who carry all the difficult memories, beliefs, emotions, and sensations uh, that uh, relate to kind of our overwhelming and painful history. And the protective ones are there to make sure that we don't feel pain or we don't get in any similar situations that might activate these exiles. So, um, an example that I like to give, I, I just usually say to my clients to describe IFS is imagine you're five years old and you're in class and you just got done uh, or you're in school and you just got done a really fun weekend with your friends or your family and you get back to school and it's like uh, show and tell. And, um, and let's just say it's a sharing time, time to share what happened with you and your experience on the weekend. And um you were so excited to share something with the class that you didn't realize another kid in class had their hand up already and you started speaking over them. And the teacher stands up and says, Sarah, don't be so ridiculous. Sit down and shut up and put your hand down and don't be so loud. And don't be so out there. And how, I mean, we'll just ask you, how do you, how do you imagine you'd feel in that situation? I'm like cringing internally. I would feel so embarrassed and like I was bad and mean and that I did something wrong. Um, and I would, yeah, I feel like I could just see my face turning red, like right in that moment. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And maybe, maybe to make it a little bit more dramatic, everyone in class then snickers or laughs under their breath. Yeah. So in these moments, we have a part of us that would take on the burden of the feelings of that moment. So maybe the belief that I'm too much, no one cares about what I have to say, uh, you know, uh, I right the things that you said, you know, I'm, I'm bad, I'm wrong. And, um, and then we have a protective part that steps in that says, I'm going to make sure you never raise your hand in class again, because I never want you to feel the same feelings that you felt back then. So then we grow up and we exile our parts, our protectors exile the memory and that part, that other part. And then we deal with things like social anxiety. We have difficulty speaking in public. We, you know, we feel reserved. We might not feel so totally comfortable in social situations and we don't know why. And we're like, that's why we go to therapy and we work to kind of make the unconscious conscious so that we can know what's going on and, and in turn heal it. So um, in IFS, what we do 
is we we get to know the protective part. Let's say it's just a socially anxious part that makes you feel socially anxious so that you're not inclined to want to talk in public and then be humiliated. <clears throat> we get to know that part of you, you or anyone. And we say, tell us all about what you have to do. And this part will say, well, I, I uh, make you feel anxious so that you don't, you know, want to talk in public situations. We say, okay, tell us about that. What's so important about that? What are you afraid would happen if you didn't do that? And the part, part would say, I'm afraid you'd be humiliated. And that links us to this kid in the classroom. And through going into that memory, so this would ask, you take us back in time into that place where that happened. And we go in and we connect with that little kid in there that had this experience. And we witness it and we tell us all about what happened. How did that make you feel? Yada, yada. Once it tells us all about the experience that it had, we ask it what it needed back then. What did you need in order to heal or change that? What, what needed to happen that didn't happen here? And maybe the part says, I needed everyone in class to have my back. I needed my friends to stand up and say that this wasn't okay or acceptable. You know, I needed, I need the teacher to apologize to me and say how, Maybe they were having a bad day and it said nothing about me. So we help the part to redo the situation in the way that it needed to happen. And by doing that, we're shifting the way that our mind or our brain associates speaking and these situations. And once that happens, we retrieve that part out of the past that it's been stuck in because when trauma happens, our parts get stuck in time and relive that situation. And then our protectors are organized around that, er that moment and protecting us as if we're still there. So once we update the system and retrieve the part out of that, the past, we have an opportunity to help it to let go of the feelings, beliefs, or memories, or sensations, whatever it's carrying, and the pain that it carries um, so that it's no longer burdened. So once that happens, these young parts of us, these or when any vulnerable part of us, whatever age, they're returned to their naturally valuable state. So they're more curious, they're more playful, they become more that before the trauma happened, they're, you know, they're themselves, their naturally valuable form. So we bring the protector back in and we say, do so you see what we did here? And when the part, when the protector sees that there's no wound there anymore, it says, well, I don't have to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. So when this happens, there's no more. So like, this is, this is a very clean example of how it might work. But once this, once it's complete, no more social anxiety, the social anxiety doesn't need to be there anymore because there's no pain around being vulnerable and open and sharing. Um, and then this is for all of our parts and for relationship OCD and, and the, the needing to get it right and the perfectionistic parts and all of this stuff, the ruminating, the anxiousness, the, you know, the feelings of disgust, the I'm not attracted. I, you know, all of that stuff that all links to memories and experiences early on when we were shamed, when we were yelled at when we didn't get things right when we were in environments of chaos and disorder so we need to keep order in our lives when, whatever it is we can heal these early moments so that the symptoms of relationship anxiety start to dissolve you know we heal the parts that keep our hearts closed off and avoid in and away from our partners we heal all that and by doing so we're making space for more of an open heart and a place of acceptance because we're no longer carrying around all this like these wounds that we're trying to like guard and protect from getting poked from our partner poking or from you know we're more open we're we're more solid inside um so that's a little bit about the parts another key piece to ifs is self energy and self energy is our innate inner wisdom and it's who we are behind all of the parts. And 
there's eight C's that describe self energy. There's curiosity, there's compassion, there's clarity and courage, confidence, connectedness, creativity. There's all these C's that represent who we really are inside. There's also P's. I don't know all of them. There's a certain amount of P's and one's playfulness, one's persistence. And that's who we really are. And that's the place in us that heals our parts. So if I was working with you, I'm helping you to be in, in yourself so that you can give your parts the love, attention, care, and whatever they need to help them to heal. So it's like, it's an inner attachment based model. It's I'm in myself. I help you to be with your, and then I have your own parts. So, um, yeah, that's kind of like a, a little overview of IFS. I love that. Can you repeat that last part? You said, I help you do something and then you help yourself do something. I think that part. Oh yeah. Slightly. So some models of therapy, some models of attachment-based therapy or other therapies state that I am going to be the secure attachment figure for you so that you can build more of a secure attachment. Mm -hmm. um, I will model my secure attachment so that you can be more securely attached. So in IFS, it gives us more agency over our healing because I me ideally in self, if I can embody self with you and IFS therapists, we always want to be checking what parts are here and we want to get their parts to soften back so that we can be in self, can help you to be in self so that you can be with your parts and help your parts in the way that they need. So I'm guiding you to help to heal you. I'm not the healer. You're the healer. And that gives us agency over our own healing and it and it that gives us power to be able to say like well if i know that i'm not my parts and i know i'm this innate inner wisdom and i'm not the anxiety and i'm not the thoughts and i'm not all of that i'm i can be with it all and i can actually form a relationship with these parts of me in a way that i can get to know them in a way that leads to the healing mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. There was so much good stuff in there. I would love to, there were a couple examples that I hear so often asked, and I'm sure you get the same questions all the time. Like, I feel disgusted or I don't feel attracted to my partner. And I'd love to just at a high level, you know, knowing that everyone, this is a podcast, it's not a therapy session. So we're not going to be able to be so specific towards you, but I would love if you're willing to, to play out that like disgust and feelings of not being attracted and talk a little bit about what an example could be. And again, everyone's unique, but of what would the protector energy be there and what would the exiled part be there so that people could yeah. start to see like, oh, I can see how this is kind of playing out for me, at least just starting to understand it. Sure. Okay. So attraction, obsessions around attraction, seeing your partner as ugly. Let's just be frank here. I mean, sometimes our part when, so I'm going to, I'll get to this in a roundabout way here. Have you heard of body dysmorphia by proxy? I've heard of body dysmorphia, but not by proxy, but I'd love okay. for you to explain what that is. So there's body dysmorphia and then there's body, body dysmorphia by proxy. And body dysmorphia by proxy is body dysmorphia projected onto somebody else. Mm. And um, so we're not seeing, with, when someone has body dysmorphia, right? You're not, they're not seeing themselves clearly. They, they're, they're, they're seeing themselves in a distorted through a distorted lens and the obsessions become, how do I need, how do, are they obsess around how to fix how they're, they look so that they don't look the way that they see themselves in the mirror, et cetera. It's the same thing. I what I'm seeing is that people with relationship OCD commonly have fixations around intelligence iq whatever but also appearance and what i found in working with people is that there seems to be a there's a part that's 
putting a filter in front of our face because that's been my one of my primary obsessions is attraction and it's i mean i could literally i could literally look if you were my partner i could look at you and be like oh my god you're so attractive i could look away and i could look back and she could look completely different or you could look completely different so there's a part that's plastering this image on my partner's face and it's distorting how she looks and what i see that what i've learned is that a part of that a part is doing that to um well there's a couple reasons uh there's it's a way to keep a distance so when i'm more vulnerable when i'm going through something when there's a lot of change happening when i'm unsettled inside whatever it is um it's a way to pull back and not like I mean, what better way to to be disconnected and not show vulnerability than to see your partner as looking like a a gargoyle, <laughs> right? I mean, so it it will lead me to pull away and disconnect. And our parts are organized. Our parts have relationships inside of us, and some of our parts know each other, and some of some of them don't. So one of my parts knows that it really gets to me and it really makes another part really anxious if it makes my partner look unattractive thereby pulling away and not being you know trying to obsess trying to figure out you know if she is attractive or not checking comparing doing that whole thing and it really throws me off and it really prevents me from being open and open with her now Okay, so let, I want to make sure this. So there's a part that can make her look unattractive. That's one part. The parts that are reacting to it are the parts of me that have taken on the belief that appearance is heavily linked to my value and my worth in life. Mm -hmm. And um, and then not only my appearance of how I look, but everything associated with me has to look a certain way has to be a certain way in order for me to be accepted. And that links back to my family. You know, there was a, you know, there was a, a, a lot of value placed on externals and, and, and looks and appearances. There was a lot of comments made and judgments about others and how they look, whether they're overweight, whoa, look at what they're wearing or whatever. So as a kid, I'm internalizing this as this is how I need to be in order to be accepted. This is who I need to be with in order to be accepted by my family, my partner, the car I drive, the clothes I wear, the everything as a way to be accepted by my loved ones. And from a kid's perspective, if I'm not accepted by my family, that's a risk to my survival biologically. If I'm not accepted and I don't feel welcomed and, and I don't have a sense of belonging in my family, it's incredibly destabilizing and threatening. And, um, and the shame is intolerable to, to a child. Um, so there's a part that makes my partner look unattractive to get me to pull away and not be vulnerable and open. And the parts that are reacting to that are the ones that need to be accepted. So it's like part triggering part internally. And so then that leads me to then go check, scan, analyze, compare as a way to reduce the anxiety and overwhelm that this other one's triggering like oh my god i'm not going to be it's and it's often unconscious like i'm not we're often not fully aware of the narratives the unconscious narratives that are playing out like oh i won't be accepted that's often really unconscious we're not aware of it but it's the feelings it's the anxiety it's the shame it's all that stuff that overwhelms us that leads to the, these compulsive parts of us to do the compulsions to try and reduce the anxiety and overwhelm that we're experiencing. Mm. So, and then, you know, as you're probably familiar with and those watching, sometimes that works. Sometimes it's like, Oh yeah, she is attractive. Okay, cool. Uh, <laughs> and then it just, the cycle restarts and it just goes around and around and around. So, um, Yeah. Maybe I'll pause there. Yeah, that's so familiar. And I mean, for me, there were like, I have this 
you know, one middle school story where like I was in the locker room and someone wrote Sarah Yudkin is a troll. And it's like, that sticks oh my with God. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. even though objectively now as an adult, I can be like, yeah, like I'm an attractive person or whatever. It's like, there's always a focus on my appearance or there's this rebellious side of me that says I shouldn't have to wear makeup or I shouldn't have to do yeah. anything with my appearance to almost like stick it to the appearance like seeking Thanks. people. And so it's so interesting because I can see it happening in my own inner world. And so it's no wonder that that was something that came up for my own experience in relationship. Exactly. And I'm sure everyone has some story like that. And so it was really helpful to hear you break it down. And I'd be curious if that self that you mentioned, like the part that has compassion or the part that has like creativity, is that then the part you bring forward to kind of respond in a more loving way to the the triggered self or the part that's judging the attraction? Yeah. I try. <laughs> it's it's tricky, right? Because sometimes the thing is, is yeah. I'll I'll say this first. It's uh, and for all of you that out there, like I want you to all know that it's not easy. Like it's really, it's very, it's this is all very overwhelming, and it's you know there's lots of tools and stuff, and it's can sometimes be really hard to wedge some space in there to be grounded with all of the, sh the shit that's going on in our heads and our minds and our bodies. Um, ideally, yes. I mean, in a therapeutic setting, it's way, way easier where I'm, you know, I'm holding space so that you can be in self, or if you can't be in self, I'm just holding space for your parts. But um, to answer your question, being we want to be in self so that we can be it's a being with these parts that are overwhelmed because the self doesn't get overwhelmed the self isn't you know the self when in full form is actually the container that holds all of it mm -hmm. but what what ends up happening with trauma and i think i i can confidently say that relationship anxiety and relationship oc are heavily rooted in trauma and it just it just makes sense to think that because of how overwhelming it is and people that aren't traumatized don't get overwhelmed like this so what happens with trauma is that we go from having a cell like a, a self which isn't fully developed when we're a kid but we go from having a self and the more trauma that happens the the more the trauma sort of it's like self kind of self still in full form but it gets pushed out and the trauma takes over so what, so, and when we can get into ourself and be with our parts and we can be larger than our parts and we hold space for them, then we want to start to, and that, at that point we can start to get to know them and understand what's going on. But yeah, like practices that help us to be more in self, like yoga, like whatever, uh, journaling, any externalization for our parts can help. Like whether it's, uh, I have these parts cards and they have all kinds of different images on them. So you can sift through them and pick one that represents one of the parts that you're dealing with. Things that help to externalize the issue so that there's a more of a sense of being with. Yeah. Uh, journaling, drawing, painting, parts cards, anything like that is going to help to be able to kind of have these parts separate from us so that we can be more clear with them and be with them more fully. Yeah, that's a great notion. And what I love about what I'm hearing from you and just the little that I know about this work is that like it is separation between you and the experience that you're having. And I think that's such an important piece of moving through anxiety or relationship OCD is that if you are thinking, well, oh, I'm so bad because I'm experiencing these thoughts or feelings. Yeah. Like, and then you have the labeling as like right or wrong, good or bad, which I know is really common among just like perfectionists and people that want to do the right thing. Yes. But it becomes really hard to separate, like you're saying, these parts of you that may feel that way, but also there's other parts of you that are yeah. feeling confident in the relationship, feeling compassionate and empathy and love and open-heartedness. And when we get to 
sucked into these parts that are anxious and overwhelmed, then it's hard to remember these other parts that are there too underneath that surface. Exactly. Yeah. The the other parts and the the self that is unconditionally accepting and loving and that doesn't judge and it doesn't compare and it is wide open and can when we can be with that like eventually when we can get to that point when we can be in so when our parts give us enough space like yes there's there's parts that are very like like our kind of like our anxiously attached parts are they are the they are some of the ones that are like yeah we we want to be in this relationship they really want to work out like wait you know those are the ones that are that need connection or they they need connection they they want connection. They they're desperate for it. They want the relationship to work out. They those are some of those parts that you know that want the relationship. But ultimately, when we're in self and there's no there's no attachment to our partner in a way of I need you. This needs to work out. It's it's I'm with you. I'm okay, and I'm with you. And I can we can share what we're um we can be in a relationship together and be our individuals and that's the space that we want to i think we want to get to because um we take all the expectations off of our of our partner we take we take the them to need to be a certain way or not hurt us or whatever it is and then that's the space of unconditional love and i think and now I'm getting off on a tangent here. I don't even know where we started with this, but um, I, I, I guess what I'm, my point is, is that I want people to know that there's a place inside of them that can be with their partner unconditionally and accept them and not an attraction, not matter. And to be able to see their essence and to be able to see the, the real goodness with that's within them. And that doesn't mean like, I know on a lot of your posts, it's like, this does not apply to abusive situations. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about seeing like, you don't accept things that are harmful, but you're accepting their inherent goodness and you're seeing that and you're not. Yeah. Yeah. I totally get that. Okay. I could even give like a personal example, like this morning, like this is kind of a little bit, um, a part of myself thinks this is a little bit cringy or gross to share, but I know it's really good for the, the conversation. Like I was cuddling with Nate this morning and then I was like, I feel like I don't even, I don't even smell that good right now. And like, he doesn't smell that good right now. Like our morning <laughs> breath is coming out, but it was funny. Cause like, I realized that like both of us were in it kind of together. And I was just yeah. laughing to myself because when I was experiencing more of the depths of relationship anxiety, I would have completely projected that onto Nate. But then I was able to kind of turn the light back around onto yeah. me and be like, you just woke up too. Like you're not even your best self right now. And I think that essence you're talking about, exactly. it just goes so much deeper than like your morning breath or whatever you smell like in the morning after you just like slept and rolled around for eight hours, you know? And so I just think I, I laugh at that because I know how triggering that can be in the moment. But when you're able to explore some of this and zoom out from it and detach from it slightly, you can almost bring some like humor to it. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. There was something you said recently on your Instagram that was so powerful. It was actually a different perspective because I think I've even said <laughs> choose love over fear before. And so you said, don't choose <laughs> yeah. love over fear. Instead, love the fear. And I love that. I like you were like, welcome the fear. And I think that this is such a big part of relationship OCD and anxiety work is like, instead of judging the fears or judging the anxiety as bad or wrong and trying to get rid of it, like you have to welcome it in. And so can you share what you meant by like loving the fear instead of choosing love over fear? Yeah. Yeah. I'm noticing a part that's, uh, wanting to give you the good answers and i just want to just take a moment to kind of quiet down and see if i can answer from more of a um a quiet place yeah so 
so if we choose if we seek to choose love over fear we send the message to the part see what i really love about ifs is that it like we have these as weird as it sounds we have these little beings in us like and they need love like they need us and and a lot of therapeutic perspectives and and a lot of meditative practices and and ideologies and stuff they view the mind as being an inconvenience and they you you know there there's a striving for for love for compassion and it, it's ignoring the parts of us that really need us and from that perspective that would make sense if our mind was just a monkey like that the monkey mind if it was just that if it was just a set of neurological things and mechanical stuff that was just kind of not working properly like a machine that wasn't working properly i could get that but i know that these parts of us are really scared and in a lot of pain and they're desperate and uh and it, it makes me actually feel a little bit emotional because because when we choose when we seek if we're saying oh, i choose love over fear choose love over fear we're sending the message to that part that it's not important and that it's an inconvenience it perpetuates the issue yeah. and i what we need to do is we need to love choose love sure and choose to embody love in our relationships and love bring the fear into that because it's not until we start to love the fear that it starts to transform um it's it's like it's that fearful part that we then put in a container or in a room inside of us and it's alone and maybe we maybe we work on cultivating being more loving and and whatever but there's still that part that's in that room and um, real transformation comes from welcoming it all into our hearts. Mm -hmm. And that's what healing is. And that's what being in self and being in love includes everything. It's there, no man gets left behind or no person gets left behind in, in IFS. It's we, we seek to welcome it all and love it all and, and hear all the stories that all of our parts have to hold or that, that hold for us. So that's why I say, cause I see it. I see choose love over fear and I, and I can, I get it. I get, I get that. And there's a different way that we might go about it. It's just a little bit of a perspective shift. Yeah. That's a beautiful way to put it. It made so much sense when I read it. And every so often, like I come across something that where I'm like, oh my gosh, of course. And like, I, it's almost like then I have a little bit of guilt that I even had been saying it the other way, but then that's just my inner perfectionist trying to just yeah. know it all and be perfect. And so I love learning new ways of looking at things. So I really appreciate that. And I hope that everyone listening can just remember, like you get to love your fear and welcome it and know that it's just another part of you and it doesn't need to be the bad part or the wrong part necessarily. It's just a part and it doesn't have to be labeled. Exactly. Yeah. A couple final questions here. Um, one thing I was, this is kind of veering off topic, but something that I really wanted to talk about because we are two different genders having this conversation. And I get a lot of questions in my own community about like, do only women have relationship anxiety? I don't see that many men talking about it. And gender identities aside, like we're talking about like me and you here. So I just yeah, want yeah. to like our own personal experiences but what is your take on these questions of like is it more common for women to get relationship anxiety or why don't I hear more men talking about this obviously you are speaking to it but there's not many others uh mm -hmm. so I'd love to know how you approach these discussions with people sure I would be surprised if um it's hard to know if it's equal, but um, I would say that there's a there's a shitload of men out there that deal with this. 
but uh, men have taken on the belief that they shouldn't be vulnerable. And, um, and I think that a lot of men don't reach out for help because of that. And uh, that's why you don't see, this is a theory, but it's f for me and, and understanding like we've men have learned to buck up and get over it and don't be a pussy and don't cry and to stuff your emotions down. And, you know, it's not strong to be open. And it's not strong to be, have a feminine side and, and embrace your inner feminine and all that stuff. So I think, I think it really prevents a lot of men from coming forward and getting help. I can't remember if this, I can't remember the exact stat, but I think there's a lot of more male suicide. Um, I, I don't quote me on that, but, but men for, for years and years and years, um, have learned that it's not okay to be open and vulnerable. And, uh, I think that there's a lot of men that are suffering out there with relationship OC that aren't talking about it. And, uh, so yeah, I, that's kind of, that's what I would say to that. Yeah. And I think from my perspective, like there's just slightly different narratives to the different gender norms. And again, I know that like some of that has shifted, but I feel like for our age, like growing up, like I had the whole like Disney princess and prince, like find your knight in shining armor message, or like, you'll have that happy fairy yeah. tale ending. And I think that even if both like people hear that narrative, like for me, I was definitely thinking of it maybe in a different way than Nate was, for example. Yeah. And so I know me and Nate are like separate people and me and you are separate people. So we all have unique perspectives. But I do think that in these gender norms, or at least like what has been gender norms, like there's always this message that go gets sent to people and then you can really take that on. And so I love what you're saying that I don't think there's necessarily more women, but I do think that men maybe have this fear of wanting to talk about this. And yeah. I think it's so important that you're a voice in this space, talking and sharing that male perspective, because I think that there needs to be more of that. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. So because this is the You Love and You Learn podcast, I have a final question that I ask everybody, which is what is one thing that you have learned about love that you would like to leave listeners with today? Yeah. I used to think that love was um, a experience that we got a chance to have when we met the right person. And, um, and I thought, I thought that based on what I've learned, as you were saying about what we have learned in the media and our, and movies and TV that, uh, that that's what love is. And through exploring spirituality and through exploring myself and through exploring psychedelic work and IFS and all that, I know now without a doubt that love is a state of being and that it's a place within us. And it's a place that when our parts aren't so protective, and so fearful of us getting hurt and, and whatnot, when our parts step back, we can be in our own loving. So we can be in love, but in love doesn't mean I'm in love with you. In love means I am in my love. And when I'm in my love, then I can, and then I we can share that and I can, I can accept you and, and, and all that. <clears throat> it's, Love, I, um, love is what heals us. Love is, is the place that it's the opposite of like, yeah, just, I'll just, it's simply going back to it's, it's a, it's a, it's an inner state. It's a place of open heartedness. And, um, I think that's powerful because when people can really anchor into that, it's takes a lot of the pressure off because if you're in your 
love and I'm in my love. There's no explanation I need from you in order to be in my love uh, in uh, a feeling that I need to get. It's already here. It's already within each of us. And we can open to that. And it's always there. And it can never be destroyed. And when we're in it, we see our partner clearly. We see the world clearly. We can look at a bird and just be in love with a bird. We can look at a plant and be in love with a plant. And we and it's 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 a very beautiful place. And I think the more that we do this work and the more that we heal, the more in our love that we can be. And um, yeah, so that's what I'm learning about love. There's probably a lot more to learn about it, but um, but I really have shifted my the belief that it's something that we get or something that emerges between two people. So yeah. we don't have to, we don't have to search outside ourselves for it. It's already there. And it's just a matter of exploring ourselves in a way and sifting through the layers of protection and wounding and to get to it. Mm, that's so well said. I love that notion of, we don't have to be in love because of another person. It's like we get to be in our love because we are love. And th that yeah. itself has so much love to give. But of course, there's a lot of things that are kind of blocking that at many different times. And so the practice of getting back into a state of love is, I feel like, a practice of a lifetime. And it's constantly yeah. ebbing and flowing. But the fact that you can remember that it's always within is such a powerful statement. Yeah. And, and for people out there, like, I mean, there's lots of different ways to, to do it, like to, to work on it. And, and, you know, one would be therapy and ideally therapy that addresses the parts and address and knows about the self and the inner innate inner wisdom that we all have that doesn't have to be cultivated or worked on. It's there, but, and then turn it in a sense the paradox of, of it is that love it to be in our love is a practice too. So what are the things that we can do to practice being in our love? One is working with our parts. May, I would say mainly because our parts obscure our heart and close it up. So in order for them to open, we need permission to do so and they need to know it's safe. And by the easiest way I think to do that is working directly with them is, you know, and in addition to that, I mean, acts of service, doing things for other people, being, you know, giving, and all those things are going to help us to cultivate more of a loving heart. Um, so if you want more of your own love with your partner, if you want to be able to see them more clearly, I think it's important to start to focus on finding that within you and, and to not look outside of yourself anymore. Like, shift the focus from outside internally what needs to happen in here for you to open your heart more and how can you do that and yeah so i would encourage people that are listening to this to start that to, to kind of start that practice and find out find your own inner loving mm, yeah such a good last question or request of people to start doing. Thank you for that. So I'm sure there's so many people listening that have loved what you're sharing and want to know more about you and your work. So where can people stay in touch with you? Yeah. So mainly my Instagram right now, it's at for love, we heal. Um, you can check out my website. It's Alex Bishop counseling, counseling with two L's.com. Uh, yeah, but mainly you can just find me on my Instagram. Awesome. And uh, yeah. Well, thank you, Alex, so much. I loved this conversation. I feel like we took it in so many places, but kept coming back to the same themes over and over. So it was really great to chat. Good to chat with you too. All right. Thanks.